it's good to, yeah, I got that thing working. I, I normally don't have to use a mic, so it's just a little, uh, little awkward for me. So, uh, having to talk uh, loud, uh, I'm used to having to talk loud. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to go through several different uh, scriptures. I, I will tell you that one will be in Matthew. Uh, we'll look at it in a little bit. Uh, so if you want, I'll try to tell you where to put your fingers at in your Bible. That way you can kind of flip through Matthew chapter 16. And then again, we're going to look uh, uh, another scripture in John 13. So if you can kind of place your fingers there, there'll be a couple of set of scriptures that we're going to look at here in just a little bit. But uh, uh, again, do uh, thank you all. Uh, thank Benny for giving me the opportunity to come and be with you guys. Uh, I don't get to be with you as much because you know we're we're down there, down in Canada town, and been a lot going on. I know uh, some of you all have come out and visited with us and, and been with us. We're grateful for that, and would love to have anyone that would like to come down on a Sunday and be with us as well. We start at eleven, uh, but we just love to invite uh, open that opportunity for you. So. As many of y'all know, we've been part of the, the church plant, which is a mission of faith, for about four years now. And it really doesn't seem like it's been that long, but then again, it kind of feels in ways like it's been 14 years. Because, you no, know, I've learned a lot uh, over these last four years. And, and when, I, when I first took that assignment, and, and trust me, it really was an assignment by God, because no one wakes up one morning and says, I want to plant a church at least anyone in their right mind, because that's just not the way it works, because it's one of the, the hardest things, the most difficult things that, that a person can, could ever do. But, but when God laid that on my heart, there were several questions that came to mind. And, and one of those questions was, well, what should the church be known for? You know, because we're, we're going into an area that, uh, some, many of you all may not know, it's, going, it's in an, an oppressed area, a, a poverty-stricken area, a drug-infested area, just a, a real tough place to be at. But a lot of good people, and, and they all need to know the, the, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so what, what should the church be known for? Now, another question though, was, was uh, what, now what role should the church play in the community as well? Uh, because you know, uh, in that area, the church uh, you know, really didn't reach out and do a lot. You know, it was uh, they're more family-focused. Uh, it just, it just, so what was it supposed to look like? You know, and then what... Or the responsibilities to those who are part of the church. What what was their responsibility for those that come and attend and, and worship there? And, and while I learned a great deal as I served here at Faith uh, for uh, eight, nine, ten years, I, I can't remember how long it has been. But I think it was nine years. I know I, I learned a great deal, but I had to go back and really look at Scripture and, and see what the Scripture says the church is supposed to be like. And, and as I did. Uh, this comparison, and as I went through and I read, you know, I, I was a little surprised, honestly, because you know, I went back and looked at what the first century church looked like. And, and I found that in many cases, and, and I'm not saying about this about faith, but just in many cases, I've I visited a lot of churches. I've been in, in churches overseas. I've been in churches in different counties. I've been in churches in different states. So I, I've got the opportunity to visit a lot of churches. And, and from what I found in my reading the scriptures is, is that the church... Uh, that we see today didn't always mirror the church of the first century, the way that it was designed. And it really shocked me. It surprised me. And you might say, well, now, James, of course not. You know, that was over 2,000 years ago that the church was started. And, and yeah, you're right. You know, we, we, we've advanced from, from dirt floors, you know, a little bit. Uh, but, you know, really, excuse me, I'm a little dry. Uh, excuse, but really... You know, I saw that there are some areas in the church that we really need to get back to the basics and that even I wasn't aware of. So, so if we want to know what the basics are, now where did the church begin? Where did it all start? Well, it all started a little over 2,000 years ago. And it started out with, with just 120 people as they gathered in a room in Jerusalem. And in that number of people, there were people like Andrew and his brother Peter was there. And not only were they there, but there were also some brothers, you may know the names, uh, James and John. They were there. And, and there in that group was Matthew, the tax collector, and we all know who Matthew was. And, and you know, we know that Matthew, you know, he was excommunicated from his people, you know, from his community. He was an outcast because he was practically a thief. You know, he would clean people out when he's, when he's collecting taxes. So, you know, he, he, would just, he was just you know, pushed out of his community. And, and there in that, uh, in that 120, you know, were also people like Thomas. You know, Thomas, you know, he was the one who, who met Jesus after the resurrection, and he doubted that, that Jesus had really been raised from the dead. But, see, he was in that room as well. 
And, and then there was also another, Nathaniel. He was in there. And, and he didn't first believe in Jesus either. But ultimately, uh, he became a believer and a follower in Jesus Christ as he continued. Not only were, were those men there, but Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was there, and Jesus' brother James, he was there. And, and if you remember, no, he, he, his brother didn't even believe in him at first. No, no, he, 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 he didn't believe until, into, in Jesus until after the resurrection and been with him all that time. So James was there as well. You know, so there were, there were all kinds of, of men and women that were there in that room, and those 120 that had been touched, they had been healed, and they'd been impacted and been loved by Jesus himself. And they had been there, and they had been with him, and their lives had been changed forever. Now, we can't understand what it would be like to walk with Jesus, to, to listen to him as he, as he preached uh, to those 120 people. But, but they had been there. So, so you know, these 120 people, they gathered in this room in Jerusalem uh, after Jesus had been, had, had been crucified. And, and he, Jesus had told them, he told them to go back there and pray and to wait. And, and during that 50 days uh, after the resurrection, you know, while they were waiting and they were praying, something happened. I mean, something really happened. Something phenomenal happened. Something supernatural happened. Something happened that had never happened before. Matter of fact, what happened there, it changed the course of history forever as we know it. It affected our, uh, them, it affected our, our, our forefathers, and it's affecting us, and it will affect people till as long as, as we are on this earth. And what happened is that's where the church happened. The thing called the church was born. You see, these 120 people, they gathered together in this room in Jerusalem, and on the day of Pentecost, something happened, and the church was born. It was launched. And, and the church that had numbered to just 120 people, it started out. In a few days, it grew. It, it grew. In fact, you no. Know, the Word says that you know, within a matter of days, it grew to 3,000 because Peter saw an opportunity. He, got it, he preached the Word. Then it talks about again in another situation where Peter saw another opportunity and he preached and it grew to 5,000. And, and it continued to grow. And it continued to grow. And in less than 300 years, the, the thing called the church, it, it would grow to, to thousands of, and, and recently to millions of people. It continued to grow. And it all started out of this little pocket of people in Jerusalem. And they began their lives in such a way that they, they shared the message. And, and then in less than 300 years, what was called the Roman Empire, it was conquered by by Christ. Within a little over 300 years, over half of the Roman Empire claimed to know Christ. Now that's amazing in, in that time frame. It's amazing. And this thing called the church, it, it, it conquered paganism. And, and if you don't know anything about paganism, I got to do some research. It, it was pretty harsh. I, I, mean, I mean, they just did whatever they wanted to do. In fact, you no, know, we love children. And, but they just saw children as just a possession. In fact, if they didn't want to keep a baby... No, it might be weeks before they named the baby. And if they didn't want it, they just set it outside or they take it and throw it in the river. I mean, that's just how they were. They had no, they, they were not, uh, had no love for, for, for human nature. So, so no, to think that, that these, these 120, as they grew, they, they just they conquered this. But they did it by, by being faithful, by being obedient. And, and, and they did it because they believed that, that Jesus died for sin. And, and, and that he was buried and he was raised from the dead. So, so they gathered together, even though they had little in common with one another. I mean, really. I mean, they, they had this one common belief that, that Jesus died for sin and that he was buried and he was raised from the dead. You know, and, and hundreds of men and women and boys and girls all throughout you know, were, were together in homes and they were in streets and, and they would gather in the temples and they would gather in the forest and, and by the seashore and, and by the cover at night and they would gather and even in dangerous at times when it was risky that they could lose their lives. They continued to gather all because that they believed that Jesus Christ of Nazareth died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. That was the belief. And, and, and so thousands of years later, here we are. You know, and we're, we're gathered here tonight as a group 
I mean, and not because we're all best friends, we're big buddies, but we're gathered here under the name and, and, and of Jesus Christ. But, but we're gathered because you know, we believe in who he is still today. Not who he was, but who he is. Because he died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. That's why we're here. That's why we've gathered here tonight. That's why we gather on Sundays. And it's that belief and that gathering that started this movement that conquered this empire. And today, the church is what it's always been. It's been a gathering of people. They come together. Now, the church is not just a meeting place. It is, it is some think the church is just what you do. It's just something you do. You do it on Wendy's. You do church on Sundays. You do it on Sunday nights. You just do it. But that's not what church is about. You know, church is a movement. It's a movement of grace. It's a, it's a movement of forgiveness, of hope, and of love. It's a movement of love. And that's why when we talk about the church, we're not talking about a building. It's not a building. It's about a group of believers is what the church is. Because you know, if you believe in Jesus and if you are a follower of Jesus, you are the church. The church is just a building. Well, you can build a building anywhere. You're the church. You know, the church, it's made up of believers. And the church has always been made up of believers in Christ and followers of Christ. You know, it's a gathering of people who believe that Jesus died for sin. And he was buried and raised from the dead. So, so when we talk about the church, we're talking about something of great importance and of great consequence. And if you were to pull any of those 120 believers of the first church aside and you got to speak with them, they too would tell you that the church was a big deal. It was of great importance. It was a great consequence. Because this thing called the church has shaped the course of human history as we know it today. Because I believe, I mean, I truly believe that the people who profess Jesus as their Savior are the hope for the world. I mean, that's the only hope we got. We can't place our hope in, in, in our government. Uh, we need to be praying for them. Uh, we can't play, uh, place our hope in, 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 in people of fame, of fortune. The people of the church, the followers of Christ, are the hope, the only hope we got. Because when God crafted his plan to share Jesus with the rest of the world, when he crafted the plan to share his message of grace and of hope and forgiveness to the world, he hung all that completely and entirely and solely upon the church. You see, the church was God's plan A in relation to how it's going to share the gospel with the world. The gospel is the only message that can make people who are blind with sin, see again. The gospel is the only message that can make people that are deafened with sin hear again. The gospel is the only message that can take someone dead from their trespasses in sin and bring them back to life. To restore them back. That can only be done with the message. And God's only plan for the message of the world is through the church. I mean, that's God's plan A. And make no mistake, there's no plan B. There's no other way. It's only through Him, and it's only through the church. So that responsibility hangs on the church. It hangs on us as believers in Christ. So because of that, church is of great importance. And, and since we are the church, that makes our lives and the way that we live our lives of great importance as well. And, and we have all read of where the church is referred to as the body of Christ. Now, we're the body of Christ. That means that we are the conduit, the only conduit that God chooses to use to get His message out to the world. It's through His believers, through His followers. And there's nothing more beautiful than the church when it is, is functioning as the church. You now, when the church is, is being the church, it feeds the hungry. When the church is, is being the church, it comforts the brokenhearted. It, it, when the church is being the church, it embraces the outcast. And it remembers the forgotten in society. Because that's what the church is about. About love. And when the church is the church, it frees the repressed. And it comforts the injustice. And it gives hope to the hopeless. And it loves the, the unlovable. And it serves the undeserving. And it blesses its enemies. And when the church is the church, there's nothing like it in all the earth. Because we are the body of Christ. 
And we are the hands and we're the feet and we're the mouthpiece of Christ to this world. And for the church, for 2,000 years, it has, it has been to share the love of Jesus Christ the world. That's what its been whole purpose has been about, is to share the love of Christ. So that's what makes it a big deal. Not only are we, do we find in the world that we're the body to Christ, but also we find that, that, that we're the dwelling place of God. Now, where does God live on this earth? Where does he live? Does he live in a building? Does he live in a temple made by, by men's hands? No, if you are a member of the body of Christ, and if you are a believer and a follower of Jesus, the Bible says that, that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit, that he lives in us. And just like God indwelled the temple and the tabernacle in the Old Testament, when you become the follower of Christ and the Spirit of God indwells in you and the glory of God is filled in you, then the power and the presence of God should be seen from the outside of you. It should be seen by those on the outside. The Scripture also refers to the church as a family. It means it's a place to belong. It's a place where believers that, that, that believe in Jesus Christ die for our sin, you know, they come together as one. And we're related to one another spiritually. You know, we call each other brothers and sisters. And we're united and we work together as a faith family. You know, the church is, can, can be an extraordinary place to find love, to find acceptance. And, and this extraordinary place comes when, when it comes around, when you failed and you've messed up. That's a great place to be. You know, there's no one that is perfect. There, there, there's no one that hasn't failed, that hasn't messed up at some point in our lives. And the church is supposed to be the perfect place for imperfect people to come to. So that's what it's all about. The place where you can come and be loved and cared for because you're part of the family. You know, we're supposed to be the, at the beginning of the world. You know, we're supposed to be the beginning that changes the world. Now, if you want to look at, at Matthew 16... We're going to look at verse 13. You know, Jesus knew that the church was of great importance. It was a big deal. And it's going to, to, going to be, the, be of great importance. So look in Matthew 16. It says now, in verse 13, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah. But still others, Jeremiah and one of the or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, and Simon Peter, you know, he, he was the one that he, he always had something to say. Simon always had something to say. So Simon, you know, he, he had to answer here, because just Simon's nature. He said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven did. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Jesus said that upon Peter's confession, he would build his church. Now, he wasn't specifically saying he was going to build it on Peter. He was just saying on Peter's confession, he was building his church. He was saying that he would, he would build it on those who confess him, Jesus, the Son of God, is their Savior. It's where it would all begin. And, and so here we are this evening. And, and you know, we can, there's many things that we could disagree on because we're human. You know, we could disagree on spiritual gifts. We could disagree on the translation of the Bible that you read. You know, we could, there's, there's dozens of things that really that don't mean anything that we could disagree on. But the one thing at the end of the day that we all have to, degree, have to agree on is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the living Son of God, that he, he died for sin, that He was buried, He was raised from the dead. And he, it's only through Him that we can be saved. And there's no debate about that. We all must agree. And, and that's the church. You know, it, it gathered together, and, and it didn't have much in common, but it did believe that, that Jesus was the Christ. And, and we're going, and, and we're in this thing together. No, we're not a one-man show. We're in it together. We, we love together. We, we serve together. We cry together. And we reach together. No, no they, that's, that's our commission. No, we are to, to love. We are to serve. And we are to reach. And if we want to have an effective, 
effectiveness in this dark world, then we have to do these three, those three things. You know, Paul said that we should have faith, we should have hope, and we should have love. He said love is the greatest of the three. Because how you love really is more important than how you live. You're going to think, now, whoa, wait a minute. What are you trying to say, James? How you love is more important than how you live. So, so where do we get that idea? That, that idea actually came from Jesus. Listen to what he said in Matthew 22, verses 35, 36. He said, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, this is, this is what he said, he said, you shall obey the Ten Commandments with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Is that what Jesus said? No, no, it's not. I saw Aura shaking her head. No, no, he didn't say that. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's what Jesus said. Now, Jesus could have said that you're to be nice to people. He could have said, now, no, you should tell the truth. He should have said, no, don't steal, don't lust. He could have told us, no, that, you know, something about living, about how we're to live, but no. He told us that we needed to love. And he said, he goes up to say, he said, and follows up, he said, this is the great and foremost commandment. This wasn't the first time that this had been preached either. Now, if you want, now you don't have to, but if you want to, no, at some point, turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses told the children of Israel, he said, hear, O Israel, The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, Jesus knew that when it got to to this thing called love, right in our lives, then everything else would follow. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, when you love me, you will keep my commands. I mean, Jesus said it. When you love me, you will keep my commands. So that's why it's important that, that, that really how we love is more important than how we live because if we love right, we'll keep Jesus' commands. He says it right here. So the greatest priority of the church, the body of Christ, is to love. Now, so the next part of it, you know, if we're going to, to really follow as the first church is, we need to serve as well. First, we have to realize that this thing called the church no, it, it, church is, is together. No, we, we're all different people, but God has called each of us to serve maybe in a different way. You know, the, the way that God called you to serve probably is different than the way he called me to serve. The way that he called, uh, called me to serve is different from how he may have called someone different. You know, sometimes we think that, and we get in our mind that serving God is like baking chocolate chip cookies. You know, we, we get all the different ingredients together, and we put them together to, kind of, to create one specific thing, to create the chocolate chip cookie. But, you know, that's not what it's like. You know, people are not chocolate chip cookies. You know, those are good to eat, but that's not what we are. And, and you know, we're all different, and that's the beautiful thing about it because that's the way God intended it to be. So, so that we could love and we could serve and we could reach all people because we're all different. Not one of us are alike. And not all of you all are cut out to, to work in kids' ministry. You know, some of, some of you all don't want to, and that's fine. That's okay. You know, some people might not be, might not be cut out to, to teach Sunday school, and that's okay, too. But every one of you were made to serve somewhere. Every one of us. You now, we're not made to, to, to warm a seat or take up space. We're made to serve because that's what we're called to do. Some of you all may be like, you know what? No, I just don't feel called to serve. We, no, that's baloney because we are all called to serve at some point. It might be in our home. It might be in your community. It might be in your state. It might be to the ends of the earth. But we're all called to serve. You know, Jesus gave us this humble example of what service is. Turn to John chapter 13. Let me give everybody time to get there. John 13. And he gave this this beautiful example of what it is to serve. Now we're going to pick it, I'm going to start at verse 2. It says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon the aristocrat, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, 
took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. How many of you are willing to wash each other's feet? Don't raise your hands. I ain't asking you to. That's serving. And and did you catch that in verse 3? Look at verse 3. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Jesus had all the Father's powers right in his fingertips. I mean, he could have stopped the earth from moving at that time. He could have stopped time. But did he do it? No. He humbled himself, he removed his robe, and washed the dirty, smelly, nasty feet of his students, his disciples. Because remember, they didn't didn't have Nikes back then. He did that. That's serving. Well, that was an example for us. And I think that we all get caught up and we forget that we need to humble ourselves just as Jesus did at times. And we need to be willing to wash the proverbial feet of the world. You know, too often, you know, we come to church because we want to be fed. We want to be served. We want to be catered to. But we are, come, we are to come to church to serve, not be served. You know, if Jesus didn't come to be served, then who are we to think that we're better than him? Because he died for our sin. And he set the example for us. So the first century church, you know, they knew that it was of great importance to love and to serve. Something else they knew, too, is they knew how to reach people. So so what do we mean by reach? If you were to look up a definition of what reach means, it would be to stretch out and touch, to to make an impression upon, to communicate with. And, And that's what we are to do. We are to love, we are to serve, and we are to stretch out and touch someone's life. No, we are to to love and to serve and to make an impression on people. No, we are to to love and serve and and to get to where we can have a conversation with people and express God's love for them. No, that's what we are called to do, to reach the unbelievers. No, the job of the church is not to gather and to talk in a language that no one else understands. No, we have this, this church talk. You know, that, that we, if, if we're not careful, you no know, people come in like, what are they saying? What are they talking about? You know, nor, nor are we together and to talk about things that outsiders have no idea of what we're talking about. We're, we need to keep it simple. Just to love and serve and reach. You know, and it's not a social gathering. Well, all that is part of it, but it's not the most important thing. You know, our church, it, 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 we're not to do church, we're to be the church. To, to reach the people and to make connections with people to where that we can have a conversation about faith, a conversation about Jesus Christ. You know, the church doesn't exist so that we can sing some songs and feel good and, and, and then just leave and go about our week. Now, that's part of it. That's the great part about the church is that togetherness and about singing. But there's so much more. It's so much bigger than that. You know, the church is here not for us. It's not to make us feel good, but it's here to reach those who are far from Jesus. That's what we're here to do. You know, so the first century church, they gathered. And they were concerned about pleasing the ones on the inside. They weren't concerned about pleasing their group, that 120 as it grew to 1,000. They were concerned about reaching the outsiders. You know, they weren't concerned about catering to their needs. They were concerned about reaching out to others' needs. But if we're going to, to be the church that God has intended... And if we're going to model that church you know, as Jesus did, uh, the one that, that conquered that empire, then we're going to have to lay our needs down and, and our wants down and go and reach people no matter where they are. We're to reach people where they are, not where we want them. And we get that confused sometimes. We want them to, to conform, but it's not our wants. We want them to reach them for Jesus and let Jesus change them from the inside out. That's where it starts. Now, Jesus said that you no know, two guiding principles uh, related to church is the great, the great commandment and the great commission. And we talked about the great commandment. You know, these are the two guiding principles for the church. You know, the great commandment is the one you know, to love God and love people more than we love ourselves. And that's kind of hard to do. Now, the first part, love God, 
that's good, that, that's, that sounds good, and we'll do that, but to love people more than we love ourselves, that's kind of hard to do, because I don't know about you, but I love me a lot. I mean, there's no one that loves James more than James. So, so you know, we've got to learn that we're, you know, part of that great commandment is to love people more than we love ourselves. Jesus said that was a big deal. That's the most important part. And then we get to this thing called the Great Commission is what we, we call it. And it simply all it is is Jesus' last words while he's here on earth. You know, after Jesus was cru- crucified and he was buried and raised from the dead, you know, he spent some time with his disciples. And when he, at the time had come for him to ascend into heaven, you know, he gave them some instructions. He said, hey, guys, he said, hey, ladies, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go out into all the world and I want you to tell my story. And I want you to go out into all the world and tell them what you saw with your own eyes. And I want you to tell them that I died for sin. I died for their sin. And that I was buried, but my Father, God, He raised me from the dead. And I want you to share with them the message of sin to the world. And I want you to tell them that, that they have grace for their sins and that they can have forgiveness for their sins. And He said, I want you to tell them and let them know that because of me, because of who I am and what I've done, that, that they not only have uh, eternal life, but I want them to have a better life. And, and Jesus said, no, guys, the reason I've done this, I want you to go and make disciples. And when you go and make disciples, I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's your commission. That is the mission that Jesus gave to the first church. And that, that, that commission is the same Today is what it was 2,000 years ago. It was the same for, for Faith Baptist Church. Of course, it's the same for Canada Town Community Fellowship. Uh, and it's, it's the same for every Jesus-following church that's out there. That commission is the same. Now remember what Jesus, uh, he did say to Simon Peter and Andrew in Matthew 4. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of what? Men. He said, I will make you fishers of men. Now, Jesus wanted them to know that if you follow me, I will want you to reach people who are far from me. He said, no, following Jesus is not about morality. It's not about attending church. It's not about being a nice person. Following Jesus means that you'll leverage your love that you have for God, the love that you have for people, and you will serve and and give towards people, and you will leverage in order to reach those that are far from Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Now, you, you don't have to plan a day to make a difference. You can, can do that every day of your life. No, God wants us to reach people every day, not just on Sunday, not just on specific days. No, but, but we're so busy sometimes, and, and we get our head buried and we, throughout our day, and, and we just forget, and we go on and do our own thing, and we miss opportunity after opportunity from God to do something big in people's life. Because we get too busy. You know, the first century church, they knew that, that following Jesus was a 24-7 calling. In fact, you know, it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 42, this is towards the end uh, uh, of, of this about the first church. It says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. They never stopped. They just didn't do it one day a week. So, so what does that mean? It means that, that we need to look for every opportunity. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a teacher. You, know, you don't have to be well-educated. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You, you just need to look at every opportunity where you are. And that's what Peter was doing. When, when, he was, when he was out walking, he was going to the temple gate, and he saw, uh, saw the lame man, beautiful, that was sitting there who, who had been lame for 40 years. And the lame man was wanting some money, but but he told him, he said, no, I don't have I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have for you, I'll give it to you. He told him to get up and walk. And, and he saw that opportunity there because there were thousands of people there. So Peter took the opportunity and he shared the word and 2,000 more were added because Peter took that opportunity. So, so we need to look at opportunities for where we can help and we can bless others. And we can find those opportunities on every corner. No, if you're called to be a follower of Christ, a Christian, then you have an assignment. 
And that assignment is to love, that assignment is to serve, and that assignment is to reach. Did you know that 70% of the people that give their life to Jesus Christ, it all came from a personal invitation to come and visit a local church? It's because someone asked them and invited them to come. Invite people. And don't make it this generic invitation. Oh, you know, if you're not doing nothing on Sunday, if you're not sleeping in, uh, why don't you come on over to church? No. Invite them. Say, hey, you know, I, would you like to come with me to church? I'll come and pick you up or I'll meet you somewhere. You know, and if they say no, then they just say no, that's okay. Invite them next week. That's okay. But don't just say nothing. Invite. Say anything. You know, get close to somebody. Reach out to someone. Make an impression. Get close enough to have a conversation with somebody. Because you don't know where, if God will take your personal boldness to reach out and invite someone, how he might change a generation. Really. A generation. You know, the, the, the 120 members of the first church, they prayed for boldness. And they continued to reach. Because those who follow Jesus, they reach those who are far from Jesus. And, and we're here to love, and we're here to serve so we can reach people and make an impression. That's our purpose, and that is our mission. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for uh, the example that you've given us in your word of how we are to love and we are to, to serve and we're to reach people. Because, Lord, you have laid a very heavy but beautiful responsibility upon our shoulders. And Lord, that responsibility of ours is to, to share the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, to share what we have read in your Word, to share what you have done in our lives, to, to share what we have seen happen in other people's lives. Lord, because it is only through you that we have hope. It is only through you that, that we have that, that confirmation Lord, uh, of eternal salvation through your Son, Christ. And Lord, we just thank you for loving us enough to send your Son. And, and, and we, love, we thank you enough so, knowing that Jesus, he humbled himself and died for us. We, we didn't deserve it. And Lord, we could never repay that price. But he did it out of love. So Lord, fill us with love. Lord, fill us with the Spirit to go into. To, to reach people, Lord, to serve you and to make an impression on people's lives. Lord, as, as we have opportunities throughout our day, Lord, make us aware of those opportunities. We ask, Holy Spirit, that, that you would nudge us and you would encourage us to, 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 to take on those opportunities and share, to share the, the truth of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, Lord, uh, just... I thank you for these that are here tonight as they come to faithfully serve you. Lord, just ask that you would lay a blessing upon each and every one that is here and our, and our the workers and our youth and our children. And Lord, just bless this church, this church body as it reaches this community and not only in this community but to the ends of the earth. We ask this in your son's Christ's name. Amen.